What's going on, guys, and welcome to the New Bark News Podcast for February 17th, 2019. Today I'm joined by Logan as per usual, and we're going to be talking about some stuff regarding the Nintendo Direct as well as the general trends in gaming throughout its history. What's going on, Logan? Uh, nothing much. Sitting here, refreshing myself after a long game of Pong. Yeah, sounds about right. We spent like two hours playing Pong before this, but that's a different story for a different day. So let's go ahead and dive right into this Nintendo Direct. What games stood out to you about that? Well, of course, first and foremost, there's Link's Awakening. I know I'll be shelling out my money for that. Very true. Point. Very true. Um, How do you feel about that remake real quick? Uh... I mean, the remake itself, it's probably going to be a very fun game to play. Uh, the thing I'm not sure about is the style, of course. I'm still the guy who scoffs at Toon Link from 2005. That's my whole thing. Um, so the, the little, like, toy look is a little eh to me, but it's still a Zelda, and I still love the series, so I'm still going to get it. I'm honestly right with you there. I mean, it, it's Zelda, so Nintendo can kind of take my money, but the style of it, I feel like, is even less quote-unquote mature than the Toon yeah. Zelda games to begin with. That and, like, Link's Awakening was kind of my first Zelda game. Jason oh, wow. sort of got me into the Zelda with that game because he showed me Ocarina of Time before that, and he was like, yeah, this is really good, and I was like, eh, for whatever reason, Link's Awakening, I guess it was because it was 2D, there was a little bit of, like, platform Forming stuff. There were some Mario like Easter eggs in there. I was like, all right, I can get into this. So I downloaded it onto the 3DS and kind of had a blast with it. And so I, I'm probably going to buy it just because of that nostalgia factor. But yeah, like you said, the art style is kind of eh. <laughs> but other games that stood out to you? Oh, the new Final Fantasy IX remaster. I know I'll be getting that one too. Who doesn't want to take that with them everywhere you go? Squeenix, you put out Final Fantasy again. Take my money. <laughs> I bought this game like four times, but I'm going to keep buying it. Ugh, the never ending cycle, but <laughs> yeah, it, it hurts so good. It really, really is. Uh, other ones? Other ones for me? Uh, I'm probably not going to stop hearing about the Fire Emblem one that got thrown out. Dude, don't get that. It looks like freaking Harry Potter for Fire Emblem. That's got I, me so hyped. I have heard that. Like, you get to basically play as a professor in the school, which I think is kind of neat. I mean, I haven't played a ton of Fire Emblem, but the games I have played are mostly the GBA games, and a lot of times your character is either, like, forced in, not developed very much, or just kind of there if you even have a character. But the fact that you're playing as someone within the world, you'll probably get to customize them some. I think that's a really neat aspect. It sounds like you're going to have different routes you can go based on the, like, house you choose, so to speak, which adds some nice replay value. And the combat system seems a lot more open and, like, unit-based rather than single soldier based this time around based on the fields so i think that could be really cool having only played sacred stones like for 30 minutes that that sounds lovely yeah i mean I, obviously this is just going off the trailer <laughs> so it's hard to say and i was kind of with you until recently i'd only played sacred stones for like 30 minutes i was like eh, not really my cup of tea but it's one of those games that i feel like kind of like a lot of jrpgs you have to put a few hours into to really get hooked so we'll see hopefully it's good nintendo i will i will give you my money any day so anything else that stood out to you in games-wise there? Um, for me, not particularly. I will be having fun with Tetris 99 at some point, though. Dude, that looks really good. It's like MMO Tetris. Like, yeah. why, <laughs> that, that seems Competitive really cool. Competitive MMO Tetris. That I, is something else. I suck at Tetris, and I don't have the Switch <laughs> online service, but I'm sure I'll give it a shot at some point here. I mean, Switch isn't going anywhere, so it'll be up a bit. Very As for true. me, dude, I was so hyped about a lot of the games that are new, that like got just got newly announced for the Switch. Like, um, there was the one game, Astral Chain, that looks so good. Like, with the, po with the police officers and such fighting against the aliens. I haven't seen it, that one. Oh, man, the trailer got released during the Nintendo Direct, and it looks so good. I actually have a trailer breakdown up on the channel, so I won't get into it too much. But essentially what it strikes me as is, like, sci-fi, Bayonetta, with a lot more story drive and a lot more open world. And it just looks awesome. And I'm like, definitely going to have to check that out. Well, one of the coolest parts is it takes a lot of the things from action games like that, and it throws you, it seems like it throws you alongside with like this AI robot partner that fights beside you. So I'm really curious to see how they implement you being able to control that and do combos with it, because it seems like you can within here. Like it's able to do its own thing, but you're also able to like draw bows along with it, do like these dual slash stuff. Watch the trailer, believe me, it looks really awesome. Uh, what else did drop, though, was uh, the Damien X Machina demo. Oh, yeah, yeah. On Switch. I have been playing that. Is it's, it good? Um, it's it's definitely still in its prototype phases. So it's got those glitches. It, <laughs> there, are some, there are some pretty funny things you can do. But uh, the gameplay itself is actually a lot better than I expected, and I was still expecting a lot. So I can't wait to see how that develops. That's awesome. I mean, that just adds to our list. Uh, that's a port, right? 
I believe it's an exclusive. Exclusive? Okay, I'm, I haven't kept up super well on that game, but I know it was thrown in there, so that looks like it'll be really good. It just adds to the list of, like, big yeah, releases we have for Switch. I haven't seen it on anything else. So right. I know it's getting a lot of hype change. behind it, so I'll have to check that out at some point. Um, other one that stood out to me was Oni Naki. It's a Squeenix game that's, like, very JRPG-esque, and it's focused around, like, reincarnation of spirits. And you're tr- like, when a spirit dies, it goes into this other realm type of thing, I guess. And you're supposed to rescue them. And as you rescue spirits, you get new powers. Sort of reminds me of the Persona system when I saw it there. And that, like, you pick up new Personas. Yeah. They give you new capabilities and you equip certain ones. I don't know. It seems like it could be really, really cool. There well, was anything also- from Squeenix on the Switch is completely... Mm, Octopath Traveler was a little disappointing well, like, in its own right. Really? I mean, the gameplay was great and the visuals were really good. But like I was, I was always waiting for the stories of those characters to interlink, and they never really did. Maybe that was just me. How much of it have you played? Uh, I've basically just been watching all my friends play it. Right. So. Like visually, it's stunning. Like it's one of the yeah. best visual games on the Switch I think there is. And in terms of capturing that old school JRPG feel, perfect. So like gameplay wise, it's like a ten out of ten. Story wise, eh, I guess it's maybe just because I was looking for something more in depth, but maybe it's just me. I was just paying more attention to the combat, to be honest. So, the combat's I mean, nice. It's yeah. really nice. Like that. So they, you're right. Squeenix doesn't really fail us usually. Uh, the other one that kind of stood out to me was we had a game called Blunt's Blood Stained Ritual of the Night, which seems very Metroidvania esque in that it takes like a lot of things from Castlevania, adds some character customization, some voice acting to it. Apparently, you can bend gravity and like steal powers from your enemies nice. but still in that 2d vein where you collect power-ups and such seems like it could be really cool i'm not clear on whether this is a physical release or just a download only thing well hopefully it is physical release as we've said before we are big physical buffs yeah exactly exactly but yeah overall i'd say pretty cool nintendo direct uh, i would say i mean if you're looking for news on it i would suggest another stores we're a little bit late covering <laughs> that so figured we'd just touch on some highlights there So let's get into some new releases for the week. And first off, we've got Apex Legends, not exactly a new release, but it's making some new splashes this week in that it's really starting to topple Fortnite's throne very quickly in terms of the rate at which it's picking up a fan base and like subscriber base to playing it, which is kind of crazy considering it seemed like Fortnite was like, why is it that every time I turn around, somebody's playing Fortnite or doing a Fortnite dance or talking about Fortnite, and suddenly you've got this game that just dropped a couple weeks ago and it's already starting to pick up that pace to where it could be a contender pretty quick. It is incredible. So, see. yeah, and it goes along with one of the trends that we'll be touching on a little bit later. So another one that dropped this week was the uh, Final Fantasy IX came to the Xbox One and the Switch. Previously, you could get this on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita, that console that nobody owns. Um, but I love it. Uh, and so that's kind of cool. It shows that Squeenix is trying to extend that Final Fantasy umbrella beyond PlayStation, which I think has been a growing trend of theirs throughout recent generations. Pretty cool to be able to play that there. Do you plan on getting us? I do. Yeah. just it, It's nice to have it on the go, and that exactly. one is a classic. I mean, what's interesting about these, though, and I was actually watching another YouTube video on this just this morning, is the fact that when they port a lot of these Final Fantasy games, the one that often gets left out is Final Fantasy VIII. <laughs> like, I know that's generally considered one of the clunkier ones in the ser- series from what I've heard of it. I own it, but have yet to play it because there's, like, apparently a really weird combat system. A lot of the plot twists feel very clunky. But I'm also under the impression it's one of those niche games where if you like it, you really like it. But everybody else has kind of an awkward or distaste towards it. Mm. But apparently the development was so rushed on it that, like, they don't have a lot of the original versions of the files still lying around. So it's very awkward for them to port. Perhaps that's the reason that we don't see it so much. I don't know. Like I said, I was watching another video about that this morning. So moving right along in terms of our uh, new releases, we also have Crackdown 3 coming to the Xbox One and PC. That, from what I understand, is like a... Uh, sci-fi-esque shooter thing. Heard it's not very good uh, <laughs> compared to the other Crackdown games. I've never played any of them, so... I'm enjoying my little bubble of Nintendo Switch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hide in the bubble of Nintendo Switch exclusives and yep. older consoles and such. Uh, going into something that appeals to my nerd dumb is Jump Force. So this features a lot of games from, like, Shonen Jump-styled anime. So you got, like, Naruto, Yu-Gi-Oh! in there. You've got stuff from Baruto and a bunch of other things mixed in. It seems like it's one of those games I could really enjoy if it was at a cheaper price tag. I'm not going to pay 60 bucks for this. Yeah, sadly, that is a lot of what dictates what I will get. Exactly. Myself. Exactly. And that's like one of the big perks of something like Final Fantasy IX is it's still a great game that stands the test of time, but when they're releasing it for downloads, it's usually like 10 bucks. Exactly. So that's way cheaper than something like this. 
Jump Force, to me, strikes me as one of those nostalgia-driven things. I'm not usually huge on fighters outside of Smash Bros. So Yeah, I do have a friend who's really into it, and of course, he seems to think it's worth the price tag with right. everything that they're putting into it and all the content you get. Right. From the gameplay I've seen, it looks like it runs really smooth. It's like a 3D-based fighter, um, and you choose like 3B3 tag teams, I think. So it looks like it's a great game, really well-polished, but once more... If it drops to 10 bucks, I might get it, <laughs> you know. And I'm not super attached to a lot of the characters in there. As people who follow the YouTube channel know, I watch a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! So, like, the ability to play as Yu-Gi in a fighting game and, like, summon <laughs> monsters to fight alongside me, that's pretty cool. But I'm not going to pay 60 for it. So, uh, moving right along here, we've also got Metro Exodus, which continues the uh, story we've been covering a little bit here of Epic Games versus Steam. Because if you're a PC player, unless you pre-order this from Steam a while back, the only way you're going to be playing this is via the Epic Games Store. Now, I haven't heard a whole lot about how well this game's launch went, have you? I have not. I, all I've really heard was that it launched. Yeah, so I'm. it could just be that we've been hiding under rocks, which is kind of the usual. <laughs> or perhaps it didn't do, like, excessively well. I know it was a big AAA release, so we'll have to see how it holds up over time, as so, per usual. I'm curious, are there any updates as to the Switch, or Switch, the Steam versus Epic? Uh, not that I know of. I know there seems to be an ever-growing library. I fell a little bit behind on some stuff this week just because of some stuff going on with where I work in terms of the news, but... I know that Epic Games seems to continuously be picking up more developers willing to do, like, a, for one year, this is exclusive to your store, all the way to, this is exclusive to your store outright type of wow. thing. So it seems like they may be our first genuine competitor to Steam in a very long time, which is interesting to see. Not sure how I feel about that, considering I know Steam to be kind of trustworthy as a source for pretty cheap PC games. Very true. But this may force them to go even cheaper. We'll have to see. And then uh, moving right along here, we've also got Far Cry New Dawn came out. I've never played a Far Cry game. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> I The only Far Cry game I've played was on the original Xbox. Nice. And that must have been either the original or the second one, I believe. It, it had a subtitle to the title. It was like, is Primeval a newer one? I, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> it's, it's Far Cry something, and it looks pretty. On the original it, Xbox. Does it play game? Does it play well? Like, is the gameplay good? Uh, clunky Xbox One controls in a shooter. I mean, it, it was, it was okay from what I played. I'm not a very reliable source on this, as you could probably tell. Right. But it certainly looked pretty. Alrighty. So then, uh, wrapping up for our new uh, games here, we've also got the Liar Princess and Blind Prince. Apparently, it's based on a fairy tale. That's about all I know. <laughs> Yep, and that came to a uh, Switch this week. So there's your uh, usual information on new games from us. Usually we're not the best off there, but just in case you wanted to know. <laughs> Alrighty, so moving right along here, uh, Hollow Knight had a sequel announced by the title of Silk Song. Now this game's supposed to be Metroidvania-esque, at least the first one is, which is kind of cool. Usually those games do pretty well, and people have been putting some more interesting spins on them recently. Uh, apparently this game's supposed to be focused around the main female lead from that game. I know Grant's been really digging it, so... Apparently it's good. I'd like to give it a whirl at some point, but I know Silk Song's supposed to be a Switch exclusive from what I've heard. Well, don't look at me. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, it, it's cool. It's another Switch exclusive to add to the library, and that seems to be something that companies are getting behind more and more is, hey, we'll just make something for Switch. Anything that propels a Nintendo platform is perfectly fine by me. Exactly. Now, speaking of some older games, because that's mostly what we know about usually, <laughs> uh, we've got the PlayStation Classic down to $40 at Walmart. If that's something you've been looking for, that's a pretty good price tag. The thing originally retailed at 100 so this is 60% off. I know you and I aren't necessarily always pro emulator still not buying it exactly and playstation ones i mean if you're looking to play that stuff other than the fact that this has an hdmi out it's not necessarily the best option that being said hacking exactly. it is getting easier by the day so it could end up being like the snes classic where it's really yeah. easy to hack and have the whole library but then hands. again it's like yeah you can just get a snes classic or something worth <laughs> worthwhile right exactly you know, so. And the entire PlayStation library, for the most part, is still really cheap. And, like, the other nice thing about the PS1 is you have that screen add-on that you can get and take it with you, <laughs> which is kind of cool, too. Uh, oh, so, way. yep, that's actually going to about wrap it up for our news for this week, unless there was anything else you wanted to cover. Uh, there's nothing else I know about Under My Rock. What are you talking about? Excellent. So we're going to go ahead and move <laughs> on to the history of video game trends. So what exactly do we mean by this? 
As games have went on, much like clothing, style, fashion, computers, color scheme choices, furniture, etc., they have trends where one company finds success with it, and then another company goes on to be like, hey, why don't we do that, and then just slap our branding name across it, more or less. Gaming's no different. So kind of our good starting place for this that we found is Pong all the way back in 1977. When this game launched, as we realized when we spent two hours before this podcast playing on consoles, Everybody and their brother were putting out various ports of Pong and various ways to pay, play the system. Now, Logan knows a lot more about this than I do, so you can go and take over from here. <laughs> well, you summarized it quite nicely. Essentially, it was the Wild West of Pong. Everyone from Kmart to Magnavox was dipping their hands into the, the gold pot here. And that includes have, Big Brother Nintendo, too. It does, yes, over in Japan. Um <laughs> It's just it, so many Pong consoles, so many ways to play it, and most of them are just clones of each other. And what's interesting is, like, you were telling me most of these systems have the same exact chip within them. Exactly. The only thing that really varies are, like, the controllers or, like, the Kmart one you showed me, of all things, was in color, where these, the others weren't. So <laughs> Such an achievement, yes. Exactly. So it's kind of neat to see the subtle variations between it, and it's also interesting to consider in this time period how much less they were paying attention to outright copyright on video games because these are literally clones that were yeah. being released in somewhere like Off the, the shelf parts right exactly then they were being released within the u.s whereas today we still see a lot of game console clones and hardware clones and everything but a lot of times you're importing them from foreign countries where those laws aren't necessarily as strictly enforced here these are like straight on retail store shelves these other clones in the modern day you have to get off like ebay or something like that that it's not as i don't know uh what's the word i'm looking for mainstream lead distributed yeah, it's not like you can just walk into Target and buy them. Right, and what's even more interesting to me is a lot of these consoles still saw pretty big success in their day, despite the fact that they were all basically the same. That's true. Um, of course, you have the original Atari one that was the, basically the only one that was called Pong, because of all things, that was the thing that was copyrighted. It exactly. wasn't so much the gameplay or the mechanics or really the software, it was the name. So yeah. as long as these countries got by using the creative names such as SC8000 and Video Sports, they were able to weave their way into homes. Precisely, and yet the gameplay itself was identical. Exactly. Like, and then it was just once more those kind of niche things distinguishing them. Like one of the systems outputs sound through the TV as opposed to through the system itself, and another one you can implement like a turbo mode and <laughs> everything like that. So that was kind of our first trend here that saw a lot of companies sort of just ripping one game and then making their own slight variation of that. And as we move forward a little bit, we kind of see this continue with the arcade ports of Space Invaders. This one I, I remember a little bit about from when I read about it a long time ago. I know this was kind of when space shoot 'em up type of games really emerged. Yes, things like Galaga and Galaxian and uh, all manner of arcade deviations from Space Invaders really started to take off. Right, and it, it, kind of the modern equivalent of this is when you go into like, I don't know, like a Mario game and you've got various game modes, but it's basically still the same thing. Like we're trying to beat the clock as opposed to trying to collect coins and those types of things. Yeah. And that so. it was mostly still the same game, just like yep. some new textures slapped on maybe and here this and there. One, you and you can shoot twice before you have to reload. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or maybe the turning mechanic in this one's <laughs> a little bit different. But these also saw a massive amount of success. Once more, I think it was that kind of softer enforcement of copyright at work and people still not necessarily having a name brand to go off in video games, whereas like once more, going back to the clothing analogy, a lot of times people will buy something for the brand. In gaming, you didn't necessarily have that super well established yet. Exactly. Yep. So uh, moving right along, after the Space Invaders craze, we actually kind of got a Donkey Kong craze. And what's interesting is this continues a trend that we'll see go on until kind of the early to mid-90s of just porting arcade games to home consoles. And with Donkey Kong, I mean, it started in the arcade. Later, we got a port to the NES. But here it started, and it kind of inspired a number of platformers based off of it. Once more, you're kind of a better <laughs> source for this one. Yeah, one thing I do want to touch on is that at around this time period, home video games in themselves were a very niche thing. It, a lot of people when they thought of a video game would think of an arcade, the place you go to hang out. Or of course nowadays we don't really have anything like that aside from dying strip malls, but Exactly. Um, yeah, so the arcade was really what dictated what people would be playing in the home and at, at some points if you couldn't afford a home video game console or for whatever reason you didn't have one, you would just be playing those kinds of games at an arcade. Right, and even at that point it was kind of like the home consoles were essentially just 
uh, lower budget versions of the arcade things. Because I mean, you don't have the power to put a giant arcade cabinet in your living room to play these games. So they were, a lot of times they were like shrunken down versions of the original game made for the arcade. And this kind of continued until like the mid '90s with a lot of things. Exactly. And that it was you know whoever could make the best arcade parts usually conquered things, and that actually dictated a big part of the Genesis versus Super Nintendo war. But one of the other things that kind of stands out to me about this is in Japan, arcades are still a huge deal. Like they have games that are exclusive to arcades. Like I know of one in particular for Pokemon where you can collect these toys that connect to the arcade system and like cards that hold your saves for you that you plug in there and you just play on the arcade cabinet still, which is really cool. That's true. Isn't Sega right now relying on like pachinko machines? I wouldn't be surprised. Sega's <laughs> company has always been rooted in arcade games pretty heavily. I know they've also been kind of thriving off their relationship with Atlas for ports because it's an Atlas game. It probably sells, and Sega pretty much controls most of the U.S. ports for those at this point. But anyway, right. yeah, moving right along with this arcade business, we uh, the next one kind of in line here was going to be the whole platformer craze kind of just upgraded because we took everything from Donkey Kong and then just added exactly. depth to it. When we, we got take basic, the basic Donkey Kong sort of platformers like you had Minor 2049er, you had Pickaxe Pete, all of those were essentially uh, either ripped off of either Donkey Kong or Mario Bros. Now, after the NES dropped and we got served with that delicious Super Mario Brothers platter, we had games like Castlevania Startup, uh, games like Metroid, where they weren't just a score-driven sort of arcade platformers in the sense that they knew them. These were more of uh, adventure games, I suppose you can say. Right, and they even had some story behind them. Now, granted, exactly. at this point in gaming, in order to get your story, you usually had to read the instruction manual. But still, there was a lot more to them. We were starting to see depth with the Mario games with, like, scores and upgrades. You saw Metroid, where you got to collect upgrades, and Castlevania went along a similar kind of design there. You had games like Mega Man, where you were taking on boss fights. You could choose the order and went what you went through levels. And this was kind of an explosion that continued and kind of still has influence today in a lot of games. If you're going to make a 2D game, a lot of times it at least has some platforming elements to it and most 3d games do have to some extent as well exactly they sort of abandoned the whole uh, high score mentality that arcades right and it was starting to dwindle off now it did continue to some extent and still does today i mean like bayonetta majorly yeah. successful uh, modern game but there's still score implemented into that now i think it's something people pay less and less attention exactly, to exactly because back then when you would play a game like at a car at an arcade for instance of course this is a perfect analogy the whole thing would be to get the high score that was why you went and played a video game nowadays when you go play a video game there's story there's you know rpg elements there's upgrades there's resources to come back and it's just uh, you, you have more goals essentially exactly the idea is to make it a much more immersive experience but I must admit there is part of me that wishes I would have been around to see the try to be the king of the cabinet type of person being able to punch in your initials as that high score thing fighting with somebody like having this rival that you don't even necessarily know for the score of just a single cabinet exactly that guy you never see at the arcade but he's all, his initials are always there right it almost reminds me you. of like the song <laughs> pinball wizard by the who like ta trying to conquer that single machine be the one who is champion there those were the arcades before arcades right but it was interesting because this even sees the like the evolution of competitive play here because we go from it being the score based thing of like you said it could be you're competing against somebody that you've never met before to as we jump into our next trend which really leans into fighting games mm -hmm. suddenly you're playing against the person right next to you <laughs> it's not oftentimes it's not even an AI opponent and this sees the evolution of controls a lot too because in order to play these fighting games it was no longer like a joystick and two buttons a lot of times you needed like three to six buttons in addition to the joystick and maybe even something else depending on the exact arcade cabinet that's true or port of the game when you got the home version right and that's when we really start to see things explode Mortal Kombat in particular and the amount of impact that individual game had on consoles as a whole was kind of crazy because that was a big system seller for the Sega Genesis back in the day because it was, hey, our port has blood. The Super <laughs> Nintendo one doesn't. Yeah, there and, was a lot of controversy around that. And that sort of helped the game get to where it was. Right, exactly. Because, I mean, it goes back to, I forget exactly who said it, but someone has a quote of there's no such thing as bad publicity. And sometimes that proves to be accurate because even the people sometimes. who are critics of the Mortal Kombat games at least got their name of the game out into the public, right? Very and true. so then people started to view Sega as this more mature system versus the Super Nintendo one which was supposed to be more family friendly. <laughs> friendly. And so it was kind of weird to watch that evolve and kind of fighting games saw our first way of kind of, um, at least within arcades, 
fighting against somebody at the or not fighting, but like playing <laughs> against somebody at the same time. I mean, this sort That's of existed true. at the in the home console was something like Pong for a while, but it was seeing it really evolve into a much more advanced interaction that, you know, one person you're playing against may main a certain character who has a totally different fighting style than somebody else that you see who mains, you know, a different character who's more like, I don't know, melee focused versus range focused and everything like that. And it mixes up what's going on a lot versus like Pong paddles both players have the same paddle all the time. They may play slightly differently, but there's not as much room for variation there. Depends on how much yours jitters. That's true. It <laughs> depends on how much your thing's skipping across the ski- screen as you play. That adds plenty of taste and flavor to the console. But it's just neat to see that because it makes the intera- interactions between people a lot more personalized and individualized. It makes it so there's a lot more value in playing against a human versus an AI because... There's infinite possibilities. That's true. Something I never thought about before. Exactly. And then the fighting games thing kind of carries pretty well into when we started to see 3D games develop. Because this happened, kind of, fighting games landed roughly around, like, 92 when Mm -hmm. Mortal Kombat exploded. Then we had 3D games start to develop around the tail end of, like, the 16-bit era. Exactly. Hardware started getting beefed up and ramped up. The the bit wars sort of coalesced into this sort of... um, hardware competition. You had to have the best graphics. You had to be able to handle certain things. And this is also around the time period where the dominance of the arcade itself as a medium for video games starts to die off. Right, and I think think this is kind of a good time to touch upon Sega, what we had brought up a little bit before, because part of what made them turn into essentially the winner of the 16-bit era when it was them fighting against Nintendo. Really? They were outselling Nintendo by the end of that generation with the Genesis was because of their success with arcade ports. At least to the best of my knowledge, they were they were outselling Nintendo I by the end of that. the Super Nintendo sold more units, but I, I, I would not be surprised if there was it a could have been that when... It could have been that like total units sold the Super Nintendo one, but Sega was outpacing them towards yeah. the end because they really started to crank a lot of really powerful arcade ports like Mortal Kombat, and a mm. lot of them actually ran a little bit better on the Genesis just with in terms of frame rates. That wasn't always the case, but I know especially with like shoot 'em ups and stuff, the SNES ports are notorious for losing frames. Andrew's being very careful not to reignite the SNES versus Super Nintendo <laughs> 16-bit wars here. Yeah, yeah because <laughs> I know that's an argument that I don't necessarily want to get into. I could just throw into. out Star Fox and, you know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But in terms of just, if we're speaking from a pro-Genesis perspective, that was one of the things I had going for it was the that arcade ports. And that was something Sega was really dependent on for selling things. And that was some also something they never really left the mentality of when we went into this era of 3D gaming in terms of they introduced the Saturn and eventually the Dreamcast. And a lot of the games that were still coming out of Sega for this were arcade and score-focused and everything else when other big competitors in the industry were starting to move on. You know, Sony, they had a lot of RPG focus. So did Nintendo. Then you saw games like Super Mario 64. Uh, Metroid was a thing, at least at the end of the (laughs) 16-bit era, with Super Metroid and everything. And these games had nothing to do with the score whatsoever versus, you know, big hitters for Sega. You had, like, Sonic, for example, very score-focused. Uh, Bonanza Brothers back in the day, just to name another exclusive, very score-focused. And just never leaving that mentality seemed to really hurt them. And the further we evolve in these trends, the more score and time-based things, people start to really dislike those mechanics in a lot of ways because they That's feel it detracts. True. Like, especially in terms of levels, especially, like, the further we get into 3D things... The idea of having a timer on the amount of time you can spend exploring an area really just felt restrictive, at least to me as a player, because it was like, I, agree. I can't go hunting for Easter eggs. Yeah. I can't go see what's in that forest because I'm going to run out of time. I'm looking for a certain upgrade. I need to find it. it exactly. Might be here. So if I've got a timer ticking down on me, it's like, well, I feel like I'm kind of missing the experience here. I want to, it, it's like saying, okay, here's the best piece of artwork ever created. <laughs> I can't look at it for more than 30 seconds. Which corner do I go to? Rather than being able to take in all of it. So anyway, back to what we were saying about the 3D <laughs> era. This was kind of interesting because along with the collapse of the trend of trying to port arcade games, you also see the fact that we were essentially trying to take a lot of the big things from the previous trends figure out what to do with them in three dimensions now because that hadn't happened a whole lot. Exactly, because once the hardware got beef, beefed up, you can't keep releasing just 2D platformers. People's I mean, expectations grow. <laughs> exactly. I mean, of course you can, but... You, the success <laughs> is varied, and especially it's kind of like the 3D trend in movies that was going on for a while as people just expected it. It was the new thing to do. Now, eventually, people weren't always expecting it so much anymore, similar to how... 
nowadays, a lot of indie developers will put out 2D platformers that are still massive successes, but still, the idea of needing to exploit this trend is there in order for success. People, at, like, at the time of the N64's launch, Nintendo would have put out a new a uh, 2D Mario game, most people would have been like, what is this? Exactly. Like, what, what are you doing? This is new technology. I want a new game, not the same thing I played on the Super Nintendo, mm -hmm. right? So with that, we also see the emergence of some new genres of games. We see kind of early shooters start to emerge. You have games like 007. This was the time where everyone and its cousin was getting a weird Doom port for their system, whether that be the 32X or the N64 or whatever. And then you have also the emergence of some horror games, which kind of throw into that shooter mix and that like yeah, Resident sort of Evil like, types of exactly. things. Exactly. Resident Evil-esque games started getting really big. Uh, more dark themes started to get thrown around. It was a very interesting time for those sorts of games. And I think that it hits at a more overall theme that was starting to go on as gaming evolved and the technology advanced in that now you're not able to just create something that you're playing for a little while, but you're able to go for a more fully immersive atmosphere. And this 3D gaming also opened up the door for games to have like more involved cutscenes as well. So exactly. it's more of the cinematic experience. You're going into a world, not it just this thing where you're jumping on things. Exactly. Like and games a were a lot. Grab. Yeah, and games were a lot de less dependent on their uh, instruction manuals for stories too. I mean, we saw that sort of fall into the mist. I mean, nowadays we don't even have instruction manuals with physical games exactly. in most cases. So it was kind of cool to see this era unfold, even if it did mean the s death of Sega. <laughs> Slowly but surely, because they never really seemed to lead that arcade mentality, and obviously that wasn't the only factor there. Maybe one day we can do a podcast on what caused Sega's demise, but it was definitely one of them. So moving along with this, the 3D era, a lot of people were trying to figure out how to port older genres of games into this era, right? Well, one of the ones they seemed to find the most success with was RPGs. Right around 1998 or so, a little bit around the time Final Fantasy VII came out, RPGs went from being this sort of niche genre that saw a lot of success to being the game to play. Exactly. Final Fantasy VII was the game to play, and of course, along with it, it brought other RPGs that people have previously never considered. Exactly, and when we're talking about these trends, we're seeing things go from, hey, Mortal Kombat was super successful, let me go make uh, Street Fighter and all these <laughs> other things. I mean, obviously, that wasn't necessarily the order things went in, but it was, let me make a copy of exactly. this. Exactly, there were games like Fighting Kings. Right, were... right, and in the 3D era, I mean, we saw Mario 64, well, now suddenly other things are emerging, like Spyro and Crash Bandicoot. Now that we're mm -hmm. pressing forward a little bit with the emergence of RPGs. First, you got Final Fantasy VII, which takes the world by storm with its mm -hmm. cinematography, its cutscenes, its plot, everything being thrown <laughs> in there. It's kind of your all-in-one package in, a, in terms of an immersive experience. Now you see other companies trying to replicate this to the best of their ability, although I feel like the N64 was sort of lacking a little bit in this well, end of the library. Well, of course, because RPG, that whole the cinematic finesse and things you mentioned, they right. require a lot of memory. Right. The N64's big thing was it used cartridges and yeah. <laughs> those didn't have a lot of memory. Not so, nearly as much, right, but yeah. in the PS1 era, we saw a lot of these games find some serious success. I mean, you had the sequel to Chrono Trigger, so I guess that doesn't fall in this category quite as much, but you also had games like Suikoden that started to emerge. You saw, I know there are more, but I'm blanking <laughs> on them at the moment. Uh, there was um, there was one game that was a Sony exclusive, its name is that's name I'm blanking on. I know there were a lot of them, and I know the PlayStation 1 was kind of the big <laughs> console to do it on, but the RPGs really started to emerge here, and eventually they turned Final Fantasy into one of the biggest franchises and biggest system sellers of all time. That's true, and one of the reasons to get a PS1 was for those games that required more memory. Right, like, and they were exclusive to that system. RPGs. Yeah, and that trend, is, I think, much like the sort of uh, overall immersive experience thing is one that we've seen things carry through. There aren't a lot of games you can play anymore without at least a few RPG elements. I think the influence has never really left us. I mean, even those Metroidvania style games, you can claim that those are RPGs in their own right. You're collecting things, you're upgrading that's your equipment, true. everything else. Open world games, even like Spider-Man on the PlayStation 4. Theoretically, that's an action game, but you're still upgrading, you're leveling up. All those things are mechanics that originated in these sort of RPG types of styles. So as RPGs emerged, they were kind of the ultimate single-player experience, right? It mm -hmm. seems like games were really trying, starting to master that. Well, right around the time that that started to find its <laughs> massive success is when we saw COD and Halo kind of hit their stride with things. Once you enter the year around the PlayStation 2, and especially the Xbox, because I feel like this is the one that had the most power for online gaming, and unfortunately not the GameCube, because that was online dead. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about the GameCube. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not, not for this time. Um, <laughs> 
we saw online gaming being able to play against each other really explode, and along with that came further emergence of shooters. I mentioned Cotton Halo before because basically since their inception, these have exactly. been kind of considered the big two. Just like Final Fantasy VII was the RPG, well, Cotton and Halo were the shooters to have. Okay. Halo alone basically spearheaded Microsoft's success with the Xbox, or the original Xbox. They usually call it the Xbox One, but now, of course, we can't do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have the Xbox One and we have the X-Bone. <laughs> there we go. Okay. question is, which one's which? Um, but, then, <laughs> but yeah, like you said, that kind of did it. And part of the reason Halo saw such massive success was learning from what people really liked about those RPGs then mixing in some of those shooter aspects, you had a really immersive environment with a specialized like film level soundtrack, and then you throw in this online multiplayer thing where you're able to play against your friends. It's adrenaline charge because it's throwing in a lot of those action oriented aspects that shooters have, and you're creating a world for people to play in with its own story and everything else. And then the emergence of Microsoft really getting down Xbox Live so you could actually play online. Like this was kind of the first generation of consoles where you didn't have to be sitting next to your friend on the couch to play with them. Exactly, and Microsoft's online service is something they're still known for today as doing really well. Right, they were kind of the first company to master that. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously the Dreamcast had that available as well, but unfortunately Sega was a sinking ship at that point, so it didn't necessarily matter. But still, that was kind of the explosion, and first-person shooters, I think, were kind of reliant on that in order to find their overall success because it was kind of a question of, is what these shooters have done so well without that online capability? That is an interesting question, but a lot of them did have very, very unique campaigns, I will say. Right, and I think in the earlier days, the campaigns were a lot more focus was put on them versus now, I feel like, especially with the newer Halos, like Halo 4's campaign, I wasn't very impressed by at all. Mm -hmm. I felt like there was so much emphasis on the multiplayer, the campaign kind of threw out the window. And in modern days, with a lot of shooters, you barely get a campaign at all. That's it's true. It's literally just straight up multiplayer for the most part. I mean, you can play the campaign, but it's kind of just there <laughs> to say they have one. It's there when the internet's out. Exactly. The it's, the, it's there when the internet's out. And that kind of brings up something that we see overall when we're looking at games, and that's the question of, is all this online gaming a good thing? Because if developers are putting so much focus on the online, what happens when your servers go out? Like, and it, what happens if you're, like me at least, and hate paying for online and just buy the game to play single player? Right. It raises a lot of issues because you're very restricted by that capability to connect to the internet. The, and even then, uh, should you pay be paying as much for the game if you don't intend to go online with it? Right, because you're essentially getting a minimalistic experience, particularly with these shooters that we're discussing. Because exactly. once more, that campaign mode we watch go from being this full experience they put a lot of effort into with the multiplayer as kind of a side add-on to that completely flipping. The exactly. campaign's kind of just there, but multiplayer's being a big thing. And that's a trend that I feel like this is the first one on our list that's never really left us in terms yeah. of being a full impact. I feel like pressing forward for the most part, a lot of these have uh, still success. Like, shooters are still a huge deal. I mean, just to name a few off the top of my head, Crackdown, that was a shooter that was AAA released this week. Still sold a lot of copies. And from what I understand, no one really plays these games for the campaigns anymore. Whenever exactly. you hear about someone playing a shooter, it's, oh, I'm online. Yeah, I, I, I prestige for the fourth time. <laughs> <laughs> like, exactly. It's kind of crazy. And it's and to me, at least, as a single-player junkie, it's kind of disappointing in some ways. And I for a while, it honestly scared me. Because it was sort of like, every time I turned around, in order for a game to have its full experience, I needed to do its online thing. Exactly. So, and it just puts timestamps on everything and adds costs. So, pressing forward after the FPS has sort of exploded, I would say this trend actually kind of ran parallel to them. And that's that we kind of saw Nintendo introduce the Nintendo Wii with motion controls, which obviously Sony and Microsoft tried to copy this to the best of their ability. But what's interesting is these, I would almost say these in trends were kind of competing with each other. The motion controls kind of introduced gaming to be something a lot more accessible to people. And when you look at that console generation, there is a huge divide between PS3 and Xbox 360 and the Wii. The Wii's big focus was the motion controls, and as we were just talking about, the other console's big focus was these shooters and was their online capabilities. So uh, yeah, I think you're you're right in saying that these do run parallel to each other. Right, and what's uh, speaking of that generation in particular, when I look back at the Xbox and the PlayStation 3 and the games that people remember these consoles for, there are very few I can think of that aren't shooter-focused or at least have shooter mechanics mixed in somewhere or another in there. I think like the Batman Arkham games are some of the few from that generation I can think of as being these big titles that sold systems. 
that weren't somehow or another integrated into this first person style with at least something taken from that shooter type of perspective, right? Yeah, that is an interesting viewpoint. Um, the first game that comes to my mind when I think of that generation is, of course, Skyrim. But right. it is still a first-person game, and there is it is still combat-focused. Right, and even part. when you're doing like the bow mechanics in that game, it feels pretty similar to an <laughs> FPS. Yeah. Like, it's not obviously exactly the same, but that <laughs> of course. the overall impact of that is still very obvious. Now, on the contrary to that, we have something that's very, very focused around online play, but if you look at the Wii... The motion controls, one of the big appeals of that is that it made gaming a little bit more accessible to people who weren't typically seen as gamers. Because it was sort of like Wii Sports, super successful. Everyone played it at some point or another. You know, you saw people from the age of six all the way to like 80 trying Wii Bowling because it was kind of like, okay, I don't have to master the feel of this controller. I can just make a motion similar to the action and things are being performed. Ergonomics were very minimal. Exactly. And it was a remote. Everyone was familiar with the remote. Right. And and it, and there weren't a ton of buttons on the Wii controllers either, so there wasn't a lot to memorize because it did the motion controls. And this also encouraged a lot more couch play because the Wii wasn't very online focused. It seemed like Nintendo was, all right, you're going to do the multiplayer thing. There's obviously a market for that. You're doing it well. Rather than fighting this whole idea and brand that we've been building up of being a family-oriented console, let's embrace it as much as we possibly can. And motion controls, I think, were the perfect gimmick to do that because of their accessibility. Exactly. It was a very good move on their part. Right. And the Wii is actually one of the best-selling systems of all time, which I think is interesting considering if you speak to a lot of people, especially in our age demographic, people look down upon it a lot. Exactly. But if you look at its success rate, if my, my memory serves me correctly, it actually outsold both the 360 and the PlayStation 3. It certainly did. And, and most of them went to retirement homes. Exactly. Maybe not most of them, but a great chunk. I remember, um, you know, first-hand experience real quick. I remember when uh, I, I really wanted one for Christmas. Like, the first year it came out, a lot of what I was hearing is that most of them were being trucked to retirement homes and right. places where the elderly would go. It was a way to get people active without necessarily needing to always have accessibility to, like, a car or, like, a driving range for golf or whatever. <laughs> And it was kind of, honestly, this is honestly one of my more favorite trends in gaming because I think of just the way that era was going with consoles was very intriguing. Yeah, I do remember, um, like, the first time I felt like the world was really connected was when, like, I would go on, uh, like, the the news channel or the weather channel on the Wii, and you can, like, spin the globe around with the Wii mode and just, like, look at all these different places. Like, oh, here's the weather in Tokyo, and here's what's happening in China. Like, it was... A really cool way to experience those things. Yeah, and adding to that a little bit of first-hand experience here, I remember for those first, like, year and a half to two years the Wii was out, you could not find them on store shelves. I remember um, I was coming home from my grandmother's house, and my dad had made, he took, like, an extra 30 minutes to get home for some reason. We had no idea where he was, but he surprised my sister and I because he came home with a Wii and Mario Kart. And steering a wheel with that motion control, a lot of people consider that clunky today, but when you're trying that out for the first time, it's, it's crazy. To think about that. Hey, when I play Mario Kart Wii, I still have to use the wheel. Right, exactly. It's it's a very unique experience that I don't think... I, I wish people of today who are just getting into gaming could understand what it was like to see motion control and action for the first time because it's... It's one of a kind. Especially because this was the first console generation with unwired controllers. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you had a little bit of that with, like, yeah, wave exactly. motion controllers on the GameCube there were and always stuff, but they were wi- niche. The Atari has wireless controllers you can get for it. They've always been around, but this was the first generation where, like, your controllers were just wireless. Yeah, wired controllers mostly didn't exist. Exactly. Like, they you would have to go, like, your <laughs> your controller would have to break, and then you'd have to go and you know, stumble on over to GameStop just to finish your round of COD with a like yeah. a clunky wired third You gotta do one. that Mad Cats controller yeah. <laughs> action, you know, with that crappy USB cable. Yeah. It's a good time. But yeah, I mean, that it was a cool generation and the motion controls thing has died off a lot in recent years. Mm-hmm. But I still think it was a neat concept and I think it did I a agree. lot to revive the vitality of couch co-op just because it kept it alive. It made it... St- once more, it's the accessibility thing. And uh, even with that, we saw like games take a new spin because we saw games like Wii Fit, which were based around actually making you healthier. And Wii Fit did not do a bad job of that in terms of things. And I thought this was also kind of a generation where we saw games start to broaden their horizons a little bit. You had games like Wii Fit. You had times where you were playing games that were educational and such that didn't just purely feel like you were playing some crappy program in a school. Hmm. But the expanse of this generation, I thought, was really, really neat. 
Now, where we go next is probably a little bit more open-ended. I feel like the trends haven't been quite as strong. I mean, especially when we're talking about the online play and motion controls thing, they were definitive of a generation. Exactly. I mean, well, uh, nowadays, tastes change more often in general. Exactly, exactly. And I feel like the scope of games has broadened a lot in recent years, and mm -hmm. I think this generation was when we started to really see that. Exactly. Because you had the online play versus couch co-op and, and all that stuff. nowadays, there's just something for everyone. Right, right. But yeah, anyway, if we're looking back at this uh, generation for a second here, like online play and motion controls were something every side of the spectrum tried. We had a little exactly. bit of online play integrated to it. Then Xbox and PlayStation tried PlayStation Move and the Kinect, all to varying degrees of success. So pressing forward, the easiest trend for us to sort of identify was kind of the idea of sandbox games. Now, sandbox games, keep in mind, these existed to some extent beforehand. I mean, you had games like The Sims and such that were seeing some levels of success. But after Minecraft took the gaming industry by an absolute storm, mm -hmm. I feel like the way open world games has been viewed have never really been the same in a lot of perspectives. Because especially with like RPGs and such, people just expect you to have some sort of crafting mechanics and such implemented in there just to be able to have it there. It's kind of just an expectation industry exactly. standard at this point. And it's like it's like with previous trends, everyone tried their hand at it. Right. Minecraft, we saw games like Terraria emerge. You saw games like Roblox. You saw infinite copies of it under various names, mm -hmm. especially on mobile devices. And then you're seeing games even like Dragon Quest Builders, which at least from viewing trailers of it, never having played it, exactly. it even, seems like a story-driven Minecraft. Even games from other genres like will try their hand at those mechanics. Right. And everybody was kind of diving into it. I mean, honestly, even Mario Maker, I would say, is inspired by Minecraft in some ways because it's like, okay. You what, could argue that. Right. It, it, rather than putting all the pressure on developers to create things, you make something that's a lot more open-ended and give that creativity to the player. Now, obviously, this isn't for everybody. I mean, I, I flip-flop back and forth on which I prefer all the time. <laughs> but it makes things have a lot more playability, too, which is something I like. I mean, Minecraft, for example, I've clocked... Well over a thousand hours on that game, <laughs> easily, just because hey, you're making right the possibilities you. literally infinite. Yeah, and then you can share that creativity as well. Right. And that's and something we've seen with a lot of those kinds of games. Right, and tracing our trends here a little bit, I don't think a game like Minecraft would have been nearly as successful if it weren't for the explosion of online gaming because of that ability to work alongside your friends. It was really nice to be able to power on your Xbox or your PC, hop on a server, and you're playing with somebody, and you're making these creations you're sharing with them. You're working together to build this mini game you're going to play with them or whatever. It was just something that was mind-boggling. I mean, being in the middle of that Minecraft trend while it was exploding is an experience I'm not sure I'm ever going to really feel again <laughs> just because of how unique it was. And once more, this sandbox element is something that we've seen never really slow down since then. I mean, that was one of the big sellers of games like GTA V, too, was the fact that it was... Theoretically, a sandbox. Yeah, that's true. I mean, just the open-endedness of it, it just makes it so there's so many possibilities, and that's what's absolutely incredible to me. Now, moving past this once more, the trends start to gray even further, because the Minecraft one, I feel like, was even pressing it a little bit, but it was kind of the best fit for that era, if you will. It, it was definitely a trend. It, yeah, it I mean, was. everybody and their brother played Minecraft. Exactly. I mean, I knew people who were pure, hardcore COD gamers. <laughs> like, they were nothing but FPSs. And I'd be, like, talking about Minecraft, and they'd be like, oh, you play Minecraft too? And I'm like, really? You of all people? <laughs> you were the guy who I was seeing drinking Monster Energy Drink and, like, talking about how you prestige for the 70th time. Getting Dorito dust everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now you're talking to me about how you built this sick house in Minecraft. You know what? <laughs> kind of cool. It's bringing people together, right? The but, ubiquity. It's it's just it's something stunning. I like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But after this, we actually saw games take somewhat of a leap backwards in some ways. Uh-oh. And that we started to see a lot of HD remasters of older games. I'm not opposed to these, so don't get me wrong there. But it started to feel like it was kind of like a trend in movies we've seen a lot recently, too. And that, all right, let's take this older movie that did pretty well. We're just going to remake it. Put our own spin on it. Or in the case of HD remasters, we're just going to upgrade the graphics and soundtrack. <laughs> Maybe add a little bonus content, like 30 extra minutes, and then we're going to punch it out again. Yeah, it's definitely a love-hate relationship because on one hand, you love seeing that this game you grew up with or this game you really want to play is coming back and now you have access to it. But on the other hand, the developers who made it weren't focused on anything new. They were just rebranding something they've done previously. 
Right, and I do think we've seen these improve a little bit over time. Like, from what I've heard, the Resident Evil 2 remake is a genuine remake, not just a remaster, versus games like, I don't know, Twilight Princess HD. Literally the same (laughs) game with upgraded graphics. And I'm right there with you. I mean, it goes back to what I was saying about the Final Fantasy games earlier of, hey, Squeenix, I've bought this game like three times before, (laughs) but you can line me right up to pay you 50 bucks again for it. (laughs) Can't wait. I mean, one of the things I really like about them is a lot of these older consoles aren't necessarily HDMI compatible, which is becoming a much bigger issue in recent times and a lot of those converter cables stretch your aspect ratio so horribly the games look like crap sometimes the the components to convert don't even exist exactly in the case that we found out earlier today or they're ridiculously overpriced Mm -hmm. at which rate the hd remaster can be a nice thing so i always have mixed feelings on these i mean the other thing i like is a lot of times they will be released as collections which can be nice budget options for example with kingdom hearts if you have a playstation 4 you have the story so far which has all of the kingdom hearts games except three on one disc for 40 bucks versus needing like three or four different consoles to play all of them in addition to an individual copy of each very true. So this is a weird trend that still exists today. I mean, Squeenix is talking about remastering Final Fantasy VII, and then X and X2 are coming to Switch, and this is a odd one. It just, sometimes it concerns me because I feel like it, it can encourage laziness of consoles. So this is going to kind of bring us into our last and most recent trend, and that is Battle Royale Gaming. And this is kind of going the polar opposite direction because we go from let's throw back to our great classics of the old to let's re-embrace online multiplayer in a new way. And the Battle Royale thing I'm kind of mixed on because I feel like sometimes it's treated as something totally new when I feel like it's actually been there for a while and it's just really caught on recently. Battle Royale as as a genre is something that strikes me as odd. Because it's not something that I've considered before. Like, a genre, as we've discussed, is like a first-person shooter. Battle Royale is still a first-person shooter, but instead of... I mean, could could you argue that online as a whole, like a first-person shooter, like when you go online, is that like a Battle Royale in a sense? That's what I've always wondered, because you had games that were free-for-all. Mm -hmm. Game modes like that. But I guess what distinguishes these is they take some aspects from a game like Minecraft, add in, like, crafting and building and such, once more an expectation set by a previous trend, and make it, like, survival-focused as well. It's really odd. Yeah, but we have been seeing a lot of it, uh, as we know, with Apex Legends and Fortnite, and even I've had experience with it playing Battlefield 1 at right. some points, that that could be thrown in there as a Battle Royale game. Right, and even and like Red Dead Redemption 2, which is so single-player focused, is trying to integrate it as well, which shows it is definitely being a trend of sorts. Team Fortress 2, maybe? Maybe, <laughs> like, like, that's the thing. Team-based is, Battle Royale? I feel like it's, of all the genres and trends we're me- mentioning, this one's the least specific. Yeah, because there's... It's, what do you define it as? Exactly. It's so vague. I Um, mean, one could argue this going as far back as the old Hunger Games servers on (laughs) Minecraft. I mean, were those our original (laughs) Battle Royale hype trains? Uh, (laughs) That's the question. And this one is one that I I don't have a lot of first-hand experience with. I'm not usually a big fan of online multiplayer anymore because I feel like it is time-stamped. So I try not mm. to put too much time into it. I try to focus on single-player games I know I'll have to be able to replay as long as my hardware lasts. But Yeah, it's... uh... That's something I haven't considered, too, is that one day the servers will shut down and you won't be able to play it anymore. Right, and it's just, this one's odd to me. It makes me curious yeah. about what our next trend is really going to be because I do feel like the Battle Royals, to a large extent, are taking pieces of almost every one of these. So I guess mm-hmm. that would be a nice little thing to theorize about for a second here. Any thoughts on what our next trend could be? Because I don't think, I think each of these trends has gotten a little bit shorter with time. Which means I don't think it'll be horribly long before we get another new one. At the same time, they all build off of each other. That's true. Which is something fascinating. So I guess the question becomes, what comes after the Battle Royale? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, for that, yeah, we have to see... Well, let's see. We just covered these new releases. Uh, nothing really ties them together genre-wise or trend-wise. I, I guess the closest thing I can think of is we're still waiting for a shooter MMO to really take off. Like, we saw some of that with Destiny, a little bit of that with a game that looked like Destiny in its name. I can't remember off the top of my head. I know what you're talking (laughs) about, but I don't know what it's Totally blanking on it. It released in the past two weeks. Um, But I don't think we've seen one totally take off yet. I 
feel like that might be the next step because that integrates some of this, but the options for co-op yeah, and everything else. Because, I mean, you can argue that games like that are what we covered previously, games that have spearheaded the launch of the Xbox, those right. campaign-centric FPSs. But at the same time, they've got a lot more RPG focus on them, and there's just, I feel like that different. might be the best amalgamation of what we've discussed. Hard to say. <laughs> Very first, hard to say. First in RPG time? Shooters <laughs> with some sandbox <laughs> elements. And it's so, do you think it's just going to be like a mesh? Yeah, it's just everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you want to play Minecraft and everything all in one? This is it. Like, they're just going to throw everything in there. It's like eight discs. We're going back to the PS1 era where you have multi discs for a single you wanna game. want to play Skyrim with guns and crafting? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess that's what's coming. So I think that about wraps it up for this topic, guys. I think it's always interesting to try what kind of progresses in terms of the history of video games and we'll probably tackle that more in the podcast in various formats with each episode each week um, as you guys can probably already tell we're both people very interested in the history of games mm-hmm. and these classic systems especially so let's go ahead and truck right along to what we've been playing so why don't you go first Logan all right well I do have something new for once um, Woo! well it's not new new because I've had it for a while and all that good stuff but it is Forza Horizon 4 I've been playing that a bit more now uh, now that I got the new TV installed, and of course it is stunning as always. Uh, other than that, I'm still trucking through the Twilight Princess remaster. Only you know, twelve years late on the whole hey, Twilight Princess itself. As we've discussed several <laughs> times, the new games to us are from five years ago. That's very true. <laughs> um, let's see. I've been playing Smash, of course, and Skyrim. <laughs> not a, not a bad the list constants. at all. I mean, are you really big into Forza? Because that was one game I didn't play much of it. I spent about twenty minutes on the three hundred and sixty with one one time, and I wasn't able to get into it very quickly. I'm I'm pretty into it. I'd say I really like the Horizon games. Okay, maybe I'm not like into it into it because if you like the Horizon games, everyone knows you don't really like Forza. <laughs> but I do enjoy the Horizon games the most. And are I they considered play... like more casual or mm, compared to like Forza Motorsport? Yes. Oh, okay. I think I played one of the motorsport games, so maybe I'll have to give one of the Horizon games a shot, just because it's probably a they're, better introductory game. <laughs> yeah, they they're a lot more hand holding, and they're they're a lot, you know, in my opinion, they're a lot better. Right, especially they're probably more with, accessible. Is, is spe- yeah, exactly, especially with newcomers. Right, right. So uh, just uh, progressing a little bit into what I've been playing, it hasn't changed a whole lot either. Although this week I did get back into Chrono Trigger. I started that on the SNES. A while ago, really, really liked it, but then it was kind of just needed something to be able to play it on the go, and I didn't have that. I have it on the Vita now, so I've been replaying that. Still a really good game that holds up, especially well if you're comparing it to other RPGs of the era. I mean, if you're comparing it to like the Final Fantasies that came around, came out around the same time, it's neat to see an RPG that doesn't have a load screen for battles. Like you just battle right in where you were walking on the map. Really neat to see that. The random encounters aren't so much of a thing either, so it just feels a lot less grind heavy. Great introductory RPG for someone trying to try those out for the first time, like JRPG type of style. Uh, Persona 4 as usual, Uncharted, Golden Abyss still, Spider-Man for the PlayStation 4 still as well, and then Etrian Odyssey Nexus. Not going to get a whole lot into this game because I'm doing a separate video on it with Jason, but brutally, brutally hard dungeon crawler. Like, I went maybe an hour into the game, enter my first dungeon, and I've got two party members dead in, like, the first five (laughs) minutes of being in that dungeon. I'm like, dude, this isn't even the hardest difficulty. This is, like, the middle difficulty, and I'm losing party members left and right. And I'm not perfect at JRPGs, but I'm usually pretty decent on them. It's very D&D-esque. Like, it feels like D&D simulator mixed with, like, design your own anime, (laughs) like, with the way the party customization works. But still, very cool game. Sounds awesome. Was this on 3DS? Yeah, man. 3DS exclusive. One of the uh, mechanics I like the most about it is the fact that they make really good use of both screens, which is one of the reasons I don't think it'll ever receive a port. If it would have, I think it would have been on the Wii U, which is, like, (laughs) 3DS at home. But, uh, freaking, it's basically you can draw on the map and everything for the dungeon on the bottom screen. You can even make it so it doesn't draw the map for you. You have to draw it all by hand if you want. And then on the top screen, you're doing your dungeon crawling and everything else. So it's really cool functionality there. Definitely sounds unique. Yeah, it is for sure. And a lot of the games aren't super expensive if you're going for the older ones, especially if you aren't going for like complete in box. You can get a lot of the older games for like 15 bucks, which isn't too bad. So highly recommend it to anybody who's a fan of JRPGs and is up for a challenge because be prepared. These (laughs) things are brutal once more. So I think that about wraps it up for this week, unless there's anything else you want to mention. 
History of video games is fascinating. Oh, yeah, man. Maybe we'll have to uh, cough, cough, make a series about that at some point. <coughs> yeah, yeah, product placement. But as per usual, guys, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe down below. Let us know what your favorite trends in gaming were, and if we're, there were any really good ones we missed, because odds are there probably were. Uh, and then moving right along from that, if you're interested in the show, you can catch us on Podbean, iTunes, as well as um, Spotify, and then YouTube as being our main platform as well. If you didn't enjoy the video, well, constructive criticism is always net welcome, and we'll catch you guys next time with more of the New Bark News podcast. See you out.